Hello. Um, hello, my name is Ian, and I'm a consultant in emergency medicine in Southampton. Um, I didn't mind Steve talking for as long as he wanted to, really, because I've developed chest pain, shortness of breath, and I'm fairly sure that if you were to do a troponin on me, you'd find some form of troponin leak. It's a real honour to be speaking to you after an incredible morning of talks and to follow Simon, who Min Lekong has just described on Twitter as possibly the best speaker in the world, and Steve, who's undoubtedly the author of one of the best ECG blogs in the world, is a little bit intimidating. It's interesting that Simon made, said that this microphone made him feel like he was at a concert. It makes me feel like I wish I was working in a McDonald's. So, smack is sexy. I think you'll all agree this morning has been incredibly sexy. If you haven't been turned on in some way, shape or form, then there's something slightly wrong with you. Look at the talks we've had already from some of the biggest names in emergency medicine and critical care. And look at the pictures of these people. They're perfect. They have perfect smiles, they have perfect hair, they have perfect brains, they look perfect. Apart from perhaps Cliff, who looks like somebody's tickling his bottom. Even the ty titles, titles of the talks are, per are, are sexy. So just think, look through your program. Airway, Echo, Airway, Dogmalysis, Starvation, Airway. The titles are just pure critical care erotica. There's even some words that I'm fairly sure are made up. So on the background of all this, I wondered how on earth can I try and be just a teeny weeny bit sexy? So I look through my photo album at home. I do a little bit of work for our local pre-hospital service on the air ambulance. And I thought, perhaps I can find a photo of me looking sexy, maybe running along, the rain lashing down in my flight suit towards the helicopter with the rotors running, off to save a life, even perhaps with some music in the background, so that I could just at least give you an air that I deserve to be up here talking amongst these people, with these people. I searched and searched, and this was the best I could come up with. A picture of me with my three sons on one shift when I was working on the air ambulance. Now, you're all sitting there with the title of the talk being Pain and Suffering in the Emergency Department. I'm going to tell you now that I've slightly missold to you what I'm about to talk about. And when I reveal the true title of my talk, please would you stay where you are? Please don't start looking down at the program and imagining just which session you could have chosen to be in. And just stick with it, okay? The great thing about this conference is you can always pretend that you're using Twitter anyway, and so you can always search for something else. But if you just stay with it, I promise to try and tell you some things that will relate to the next shift you do in the ED. Because the real title of my talk is going to be Chronic Pain in the Emergency Department. Hmm. I wasn't quite sure what reception I was going to get. So with all things, perhaps a little anti-smack, let's just start with a case presentation. Let's picture the scene. You're in your local emergency department, it's a Saturday evening, you've been there for quite a few hours by now, and you're due your meal break. Your consultant, someone not unlike me, looks at you with pleading eyes and says, but Minus is really busy. Couldn't you just pop and see one more patient? You walk gently past the coffee room, wistfully smelling the caffeine, into the Minus area, and you pick up the next card. And the triage says, exacerbation of chronic back pain. Your heart literally sinks, and a small piece of you dies inside. You imagine that just possibly you can put this card back in the rack and no one will ever notice. Unfortunately, the sister in charge of minors has seen you, and she's given you one of her looks, and you know that you must go and see this patient. You take the card, dreading what you might find as you walk into the cubicle, perhaps a case of tinted speculopathy with a crazy, drug-seeking nutter. You get there, and you find a middle-aged, 67-year-old woman who presents purely with an exacerbation of her chronic back pain. She tells you, as you stand there taking the history, that she's had this chronic back pain since she rolled a Land Rover on a rural lane in Yorkshire some 40 years ago. She's been seen by a whole host of specialists, and she usually wouldn't want to come to the emergency department. She's really sorry she's bothered you on a busy Saturday, but she just didn't know what to do. She just had too much pain. That's her only symptom, too much pain. She's not got any neurological symptoms whatsoever, just too much pain. 
The kindly receptionist has always asked for her past medical history and her notes, and these have turned up on the side. Been brought in by a porter who's now also been treated in the next cubicle for acute back pain. <laughs> and you ask the patient a little bit about her drug history. She's on a dose of MST that would probably knock out a horse. And when she's not taking the MST, she takes more Oromorph just in case. She's on benzodiazepines for just when the oromorph and the morphine don't do it. And she even has something called a dorsal column stimulator, which you're really not sure what that's all about. The word stimulate has always been used in terms with other gadgets, as far as I was concerned. You do an examination, and you find nothing abnormal. We've just had a lecture in our local hospital about quadriquina syndrome, back pain. That's a bad thing. We need to rule out these bad things. So you do a neurological examination and find that that's normal too. Despite this, you remember that it's very important to do a PR examination. So this lady who's presented to you with the worst pain that she's probably ever had, you turn on her side and you insert a finger into her bottom. And then you ask her if it feels normal. <laughs> Now, my current life experience tells me that this never feels normal. I won't do a straw poll to find out how many of you believe this is normal, but we do it anyway. Already, in your mind, you're wondering just how you can get this patient turfed to somebody else. She's told you in her history that she lives alone. There's no way you're going to get her home tonight. So you're already imagining what you can do to get her through to the night team and hand her over, and you're booking that short-stay bed. One way we can do this is we'll give her a bit of analgesia. Now, she could just be a drug-seeking drug crazy. So we're pretty generous, and we give her 10 milligrams of Oromorph. That should do it. And then just to take a little bit more time, we do some blood tests for reasons that pass all human understanding. <laughs> and then you walk out and you head off to have your meal break. Let's just park our patient for one minute and just consider a little bit about patients who come to us with chronic pain. Because undoubtedly, they do cause us some suffering. I want to start with perhaps my most important message of the morning. And if you remember nothing else than this, I'm a happy man. No patient ever wants to be in an emergency department. It's not where they dreamed they would one day end up. When I ask my eight-year-old son, Archie, who you saw in that picture, what does he dream of being in the future when he's older? He talks about all sorts of things, but not once has he ever said to me, do you know what, Daddy? I want to be a frequent flyer in the ED. <laughs> and while we're at it, should we probably try and just get rid of that terminology, a frequent flyer? Because frankly, these patients didn't sign up to this loyalty scheme. They don't really seem to get much for it, and the more they attend doesn't mean that they get a flight to Paris. So let's always remember that no patient wants to be in the emergency department, and let's try and stop labeling these patients as frequent flyers. Sometimes it's a good thing to reframe a little bit what we think about and use different words for the same thing. So if you look in a thesaurus, one of the synonyms for pain is suffering. Now, we see patients with pain all the time, We like to think we're good at getting rid of pain. Sometimes it's just another patient with pain. And perhaps next time you see a patient with pain and you're tired and you're hungry, instead of using the word pain, use the word suffering. Not just that there's a patient with pain in cubicle six, but there's a patient who's suffering. Because patients who have pain are suffering. And frankly, none of us human beings want to see anybody suffer. Let's define what chronic pain is all about. And who gets labeled as having chronic pain. It's now traditionally regarded as patients who have a pain that lasts for more than three months, despite there being no real ongoing pathology. It may be after an acute injury, but that injury is healed, but the pain has persisted. This is an incredibly common problem. This is figures for, these are figures from New South Wales, just showing the prevalence of acute pain, of chronic pain in the, in the community. If you look at the numbers, it's almost Extraordinary, a quarter of patients above the age of 65 suffer every day with some form of chronic pain. Unsurprisingly, not only is it really common, but we spend a lot of money on it. We spend more on chronic pain than we do on ischemic heart disease, asthma, stroke, and loads of other diagnoses that we do spend an awful lot more time thinking about, studying, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Our patients don't think we do this very well. This is when I was preparing this talk, I just went to Twitter and I typed in the search chronic pain, and this was the first tweet that came up. 
Our patients wonder what on earth it is we've been doing at medical school. I do admit that she didn't know a huge amount about medical education, because in my world, eight years means you're probably not succeeding if you're going to medical school for quite that long. But if we put that to one side, they don't think that we know about chronic pain. And actually, we probably don't. We should always remember that acute pain is a necessary phenomenon. It's part of evolution, and evolution is a clever thing. Acute pain gives our body the reminder that we need to stop doing whatever it was that we were doing to allow healing and to let our bodies rest. So pain is necessary. Some of you may remember this diagram from medical school, and this is as physiological as we're going to get this morning. I put this up for several reasons, not least because it allows me to say the words Paxinian corpuscle. Try it. Paxinian corpuscle, two of perhaps the most satisfying words in human biology. I recommend that if you're ever in a stressful situation in the recess room, just pause, take a moment, say the two words Paxinian corpuscle, and the whole world becomes a little bit better. You'll see on here the neural networks that you remember from medical school. That stimulus from the Paxinian corpuscle is sent up nerve fibers into the spinal cord and up to the thalamus, where these messages are fired off to all clever bits of the brain, and that interprets you as having a pain. A painful stimulus. Now, even at this stage, the brain can reinterpret those messages. Imagine it's early in the morning, you've decided to go for a run on Gold Coast Beach. I understand that Australia has snakes. You're on Gold Coast Beach and you see a snake. This is a scary thing. You see the snake and you aim to run away from the snake. Unfortunately, you are unaware that a clumsy, clumsy administrative assistant has dropped a box of drawing pins on the beach. These things happen. So as you're running away from the snake, you tread on the box of drawing pins that are all scattered over the beach. Your body doesn't feel that pain. It keeps you running to get away from that scary, worrying stimulus of the snake. It's only when you've got away from the snake that your brain allows you to start feeling that pain. Because at the moment of stepping, the snake was more of a concern than the drawing pins. In chronic pain, these messages have gone awry. The brain isn't working in the way it possibly should. It's now into over-interpreting pain messages. Your pain is wound up, it's ramped up, so that pain's being felt all the time. The brain just can't compute it all, and the patient is feeling pain. This pain is real, this pain is not made up. Yes, the pain is it's not in their head, but it is in their head, if you see what I mean. Now, there are predisposing factors that make people more likely to suffer with chronic pain. And almost inevitably, these are tragic. And if you spend some time with patients who have chronic pain and ask them about their past history, you will hear stories of unimaginable tragedy. They may have been abused as children, physically, emotionally neglected as children. They may have been bullied. There's also parts of personality that make you more likely to suffer with chronic pain. So if you're a per perfectionist or you have a tendency to cast, 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 I knew that, I should have practiced that word. That word there. Thank you so much to the Australian who taught the Englishman how to say the English word. <laughs> Don't get into that, Ian. It's all going fine, just internal monologue. It's more common in patients of a lower social standing. And actually, it's also more common in um, post-pubertal post women. It's thought to be something to do with estrogen. So these are the risk factors that we can recognize that may cause patients to be more likely to suffer with chronic pain. And what this means to us is that it that matters. It matters what we say. It matters what we say to patients with acute pain. If you see a patient who's trod on some drawing pins and sprained their ankle, it matters how you reassure them and what you say. Because if your patient has predisposing factors that might make them more likely to suffer with chronic pain, those messages are embedded very quickly, within a couple of days, and they're concrete thinking by two weeks. So if you're not careful about what you say on day one to that patient, you may be subjecting them to days, weeks, perhaps even months of pain. I want you to remember that patients with chronic pain are different to patients with fabricated illness. Our patients with chronic pain are not drug-seeking. They're seeking help. If you look at the drug history for the lady we talked about earlier, she doesn't need to go anywhere to seek drugs except to take her prescription to the chemist. The patients who have fabricated illness are very, very different. They present with an atypical history, often an atypical examination. You can often just pick it up that they're just not quite right. 
You might offer them investigations and they will refuse those. And when you try and get past medical history from them or their doctor, they'll say that they, they're not being looked after in this area more, or you won't be able to find out, or all sorts of different clues that tell you that that patient isn't quite what they're trying to make out to be. They are often seeking drugs, but they are rare and they are different to the patient with chronic pain. Our patients with chronic pain are not drug seeking. So chronic pain is real suffering, often on the background of physiological abuse, a, physio a physiological problem at the very beginning, like a trauma, like our patient who had the RTC, but also on the background of huge psychological stress. Now, some of you will recognize this man, especially the Americans in the audience, because it's important to remember that patients with chronic pain can lead very fulfilled, very full, very active lives. This is John F. Kennedy in his younger Navy days, and JFK suffered with chronic pain. Not a day went by when he didn't have some form of pain, and if you watch old movies of him, you'll often see him walking along using crutches. Now, this pain began in his early years after a minor sports injury. And if you read about his journals and how he used to feel, you'll find out that his pain, his chronic pain, used to get worse at times of stress. So during the Cuban Missile Crisis, a time when you kind of hoped he wouldn't be high on drugs or in pain, he was actually suffering greatly from chronic pain. But throughout the thousand days of his presidency, he only ever missed one day at work because of illness. And that day that he missed was because of tonsillitis and not his chronic pain. Now, he turned to all sorts of different people to try and get help, as our chronic pain patients do. And he saw a, 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 a should we carefully call him a quack, called Dr. Max Jacobson or Dr. Feelgood. And Dr. Feelgood would plow him full of all sorts of medications and probably spent a lot of his time reassuring JFK that this was going to help, this was going to be better, this was going to get help. And JFK once said rather famously about these medications that Dr. Feelgood was giving him, he said, I don't care if it's horse piss, it works. And that's perhaps how our chronic pain patients feel, they just want something. But it was the psychology that he was managing, not the physical and biochemical and physiological abnormality. There's even a theory that chronic pain played a small part in JFK's death. On the day of his assassination, as he was in the motorcade in the back of that limo driving through Dallas, he was wearing a back brace because it was thought that maybe a back brace might help patients with chronic back pain. And you'll remember that there were several shots fired and the first shot glanced him to the side of his head. Now that shot should have pushed him forward and laid him forward in the car out of the way of the second fatal shot that got him in the back of the head. But he was wearing a back brace, so he was sitting up erect in the back of the car, and he wasn't able to lean forward. So the second shot hit him straight in the back of the head and killed him. So when you're asking yourself who killed JFK, you could probably say that chronic pain killed JFK. So what can we possibly do in the emergency department where we don't have long, we don't have a huge amount of skills in this area, how can we make these patients feel better when they turn to us in their hours of need? Well, the first thing to do is to listen, to find out what it is that's driven them to come and see you in the emergency department, because you're not really the point of first, the first point of call, you're the point of last resort. Sit with them, find out why it might be that things have happened. Make a plan for how you're going to look after them. You might be able to offer them a little bit more of their usual medication, but more than that, you're going to make a plan for the future. You think you might want to talk about getting hold of their general practitioner or their chronic pain consultant. At Southampton, we have a system where we highlight the patients with chronic pain and we try and put together a pain management plan for them or a patient management plan. This is a plan that is put together, it's rather labor intense, with the ED consultant and a chronic pain consultant if they have one, and other interested parties, including the patient themselves. And we get the patient to sign off on this is what their care plan will be if they come to the ED. This plan prints out automatically when the patient books in. So you don't need to go and search for it or find it on the computer. The doctor will find it in the patient's notes when they go to see them. And it offers a step-by-step -step guide on how to look after them. This reduces the stress levels on behalf of all concerns, not least because our junior colleagues will get very concerned about withholding medications that they may want to give, because sometimes you're not going to be giving large doses of opiates to these patients. And it helps just diffuse that stressful situation. 
It also prevents us giving those inappropriate medications that may reinforce the illness behavior and bring the patient back to us. Now, this method has been studied, and there's several good papers that highlight that this is a way in which we can reduce attendances at the emergency department. Now, this isn't just about reducing attendances, it's about improving quality as well. And in Southampton, we're about to start a randomized controlled trial where the use of a care plan is the intervention, looking at whether this helps patients, how they feel, their times of attendance, but also the qualities of patient care. So let's go back to our patient. You've been having a cup of tea and a biscuit, and you thought, well, do you know what? I'll just listen to one of the Smack podcasts. And you've been through all the sexy ones, because they're the ones you listen to first, and you came across this one. And you had a little listen, didn't take too long. And you decided to go back and see her with fresh eyes. So you go back through to the short stay ward where she is now. Unsurprisingly, the 10 milligrams of Oromorph didn't do a huge amount to help her. And instead of standing over her and finding out facts, you pull up a chair, you sit down, and you listen. And you listen to her story. You ask her if there's a reason why she's there today you find out that it's the anniversary of her husband's death, that she's been finding it very difficult to cope. She lives alone and feels socially isolated. She does have some family, but they live far away. They've got their own families now. They do what they can, but there's not much that they feel they can offer. She hates coming to see you. She didn't want to have to do this today, but she had nowhere else to turn. You listen and you offer her some support, emotional support. You tell her that there's not a huge amount we can do in the emergency department, but you give her a little bit more of her extra medication. And more importantly that, you promise to get hold of her GP on the next working day and her chronic pain consultant to make a plan for how she can cope when things get too bad. She starts talking, because she's really just wanted to talk to somebody, and she tells you more and more about her family. She tells you about her son. She's got two sons who she's obviously incredibly proud of, perhaps pathologically so. And she talks about her sons, and she tells you that one of her sons is a really successful musician, conducting choirs across the UK. And another one of her sons is a doctor. He's a consultant in emergency medicine. Because one of her sons is me, because Mrs. PB is my mum. So what I want you to remember is that these patients are suffering real pain. Chronic pain is real pain. The physiology is different from what we see with patients with acute pain, so our usual medicines may not work. We need to try and give ourselves time to listen, to manage that patient's expectations, and to make a plan for the future for how they're going to cope when they have the exacerbations of this pain. And more than that, just for me, remember that these patients have families, and they'll be really grateful to you for doing all you can to help them. Thank you very much. It's been an honor.